Hi, welcome to this uh, focus on the Coma Electronique uh, field kit. Today I'll be looking at um, basically how to work with the field kit using sensors and switches. So if you had a chance to uh, get into the field kit, experiment with it, you know that uh, one of its strengths is its uh, versatility in terms of being able to use different modes of control, um, your ability to, to interact with um, processes and sources that in the past you normally couldn't have. Um, now, uh, actually, a friend on um, Facebook mentioned to me and on YouTube that, you know, little bits, the Korg little bits kit um, kits allow you to do some of this. And of course, that's true. I mean, there are a lot of other alternatives out there to do electroacoustic music. But one of the things I love about the field kit is its um, form factor. It's very compact. It's easy to use. And really, out of the box, you can immediately um, work on making music. Um, just to let you know, in the future, I'll do, um, I should actually do an unboxing feature talking about what you get in uh, receiving the field kit and also in the expansion pack. And then I will be doing other features on, say, the um, component of using the uh, DC uh, driver for various um, purposes. Today, we're focusing just on switches and sensors. So um, I should say that what inspired thinking about some of this, and I will be sharing with you um, today and in some future videos, a couple of the diagrams I created um, remind me, or I guess I'll remind myself right now, I will um, put these uh, available for download on my um, one of my websites so you can download the PDF if you want to check these out and get a sense of how I'm thinking through conceptually uh, the field kit. So one of the things for me that was really exciting about the field kit when I first got it was that it really took me totally out of my comfort zone. It took me um, in a new place in terms of thinking about sound and music. So I was just thinking about this today as an example. Um, and this is the Roland uh, TB3 uh, bass box, perfectly fine bass box, certainly. Um, and by the way, as a bit of an editorial, I know you'll meet people that will talk about um, you know, they don't like certain gear or certain brands or whatever. I've never been a, a snob about that. Um, I remember years past, um, some people telling me about some Behringer equipment. And, you know, my thought is on anything you own, if it's consumer-based, if it's more experimental, regardless of the brand, regardless of the approach, depending on what you can do with it, um, your abilities, your creativity, your, your insights, um, you can do anything with just about any device out there. So I just really, as an editorial, don't like that sort of snobbery about this. But I mentioned this in the context of the Roland TB3. Um, when the Ira line came out, I think it was you know controversial in some respects, maybe because of its design or um, some of the features or whatever. But um, I wanted to mention this because one of the things that is interesting about the field kit in terms of thinking about sound design, the interaction of electric and acoustic elements. When you think about any piece of gear, if I got the TB3 out right now, I powered it on, um, other than the rhythm, the you know note duration, the tempo, um, the things I could do musically, when I get into the actual sound itself, what can I do with the device? And so, you know, in some cases you say, well, there's there are limitations based on what's available in the device or with the device. So I can adjust the cutoff, the resonance, the accent, the effect. And this changes per patch. And I'm not necessarily interested in talking about the TB3, but I'm using this as an example. Because what I think is cool about the field kit is it totally takes you out of your previous paradigm in terms of thinking about music and requires you to do something entirely different. And that's certainly the case with switches and sensors. Um, so for me, this was an inspiration when I first received it because it was like, wow, this is entirely new and amazing and gets me to think about things in a new sense. Um, one of the, the cool things about the uh, field kit is how it gets you to think about the interaction of various elements. And actually, when we get conceptual about this, and in the future I'll be doing some more conceptual videos, I was thinking about all the great literature out there on um, interaction design, people interacting with iPhones, people interacting with um, musical devices, whatever. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is that as you're putting together um, your own uh, design, and this is one of the handouts I'm working with. And by the way, if you're curious, this basal plan here is not just a centerpiece, it would be a bad centerpiece. It's actually going to come into play um, in one of our experiments with the sensors or switches. So stay tuned for that. But so in this particular chart, I was interested in thinking about what really happens when you create a sound experiment or a musical piece. This is going to vary, of course. If you're using your your DAW and, and VST sense and so forth and doing this on a computer, 
some of this changes, and I think that's why this device here, the Field Kit, is revolutionary for what it does to you mentally, cognitively, thinking about the concept behind your music. So as I was putting this together, I thought, you know, in doing any song, um, you think about the context, what you want to happen um, in your experiment. In the case with the Field Kit, all this is different because it's not like when I sit down and I compose some music on my computer, say, using Native Instruments Contact, which is my primary approach, and various libraries and plugins. Um, I'm not thinking in this way. So none of these things, I'm not thinking about chance operations. I'm not necessarily, you know, I could be thinking about the sound design in terms of its quality, um, it, you know, things like mood, but using devices, robots, switches, sensors, none of this comes into play when you're doing something in a virtual synth format. And I think that's the disadvantage of working with the virtual synth versus, say, modular, semi-modular, or something like the Field Kit, which really goes beyond, I think, our typical expectations about um, synths or um, you know, musical equipment, sound equipment, and so forth. You always, I think, w with something like the Field Kit, you think about interaction. What is going to interact with what? As you see later, um, the videos I'll do, I'll talk about more of this, but I wanted to mention, you know, the back of the 50 ways to use the field kit has these handy patch uh, sheets. And essentially, this is a device that has uh, seven blocks, and this is, you know, mentioned in the manual. Um, so we have the mixer as one block, of course. Uh, we have the outputs, including the auxiliary out and the speaker out. We have the main um, area we're focusing on today, and that is going to be the sensor um, and the uh, switches, which is going to, which could control various elements internally or externally. That's what's pretty cool about the field kit is you can always move inside and outside of the unit itself and control other things or have other things control it or internally have really interesting feedback system setting up where I can have a DC driver of some sort, a fan or whatever, have that interacting with a sensor or the LFO or uh, a piezo mic or something else that is internal to the field kit itself. And that's what's amazing about the field kit is everything is self-contained in this very small uh, space. So continuing with the blocks, of course, you have the envelope follower, the DC interface, which we'll get to in another video. You have the CV radio, which I think is, is really handy. And then you have the LFO, which is really cool for doing um, electronic experiments with your other modular gear, giving that extra LFO to make things a little crazy or different. So um, patch sheets are pretty cool. I haven't used these yet, but I wanted to mention this just in terms of diagramming or talking about the seven blocks that are available uh, with the field kit. So, you know, as you think about the seven blocks, you start thinking about interaction. What is interacting with what? Do I have the DC driver um, interacting with another element here, internal to the unit or external? What about the LFO? Um, today we're going to talk about using sensors and switches in this interactive arena. And then lastly, we have process. What elements, patching, or design will take place? So do I get the um, DC um, interface interacting with a, a pizza or, or a contact mic? Do I have the LFO interacting at the CV level with some of my external gear? Again, the sky is the limit, and I mentioned um, the, the various sources on designing interactions and interac interaction design because I think this particular unit encourages that level of creativity or thinking about how we interact um, in a musical sense. And, you know, my other hat I wear is focusing on uh, immersive uh, space design, and I've been thinking about a device like this, interestingly enough, could create some very interesting uh, installations when you think about using these sensors. And we'll talk about that later. Um, so we'll maybe come back to this handout later. Um, we'll be talking about this next one today, just as far as how we think about um, levels of interaction, feedback, and so forth. So what I was trying to do on this is diagram, essentially, how I'm using this in the context of sensors and switches. So this is focused on the field kit as a sound interaction and feedback device. So I think the two things to think about from the beginning is you have um, patching. And of course, patching in terms of the seven blocks here is very nonlinear. Again, to go back to the TB3, I don't really think about using that device in the sense of patching, right? I'm never thinking about an oscillator on that device. At most, I'm probably thinking about a few parameters of the sound. Um, some of that is preset in terms of the effects and so forth. And that's why I really believe the modular and semi-modular movement has been so powerful in the last, say, 
five or so years because people really want to do new things with their sound and they want, I think, a, a sense of non-linearity in terms of sound design. Same thing with the VST, right? If you uh, power up Native Instruments or Omnisphere, amazing, amazing sounds. I mean, you're talking about some patches there that could be multiple gigs in terms of their size. That's amazing power to have with the patch. I think back to the days of uh, working with S10 Roland um, uh, samplers, which, you know, sampled at a really low, like 24 kilohertz. And, uh, you know, you, you had these little teeny disks and you had very little information in terms of the fidelity of the sound that you're working with in terms of that sample. Um, so I think what's what's cool about working in this arena in terms of interaction and feedback is it's entirely new and as I said in terms of the patching nonlinear. The second thing to think about is you have interaction feedback that can happen internally and externally to the device. So in other words internal if I'm using the CV radio in combination with the LFO or uh, the DC driver in combination with a contact microphone or something like this that's internal to the device. So I'm, I'm still creating uh, you know, some interesting sound designs, but I can do that externally as well by bringing in other CV gear, other equipment, and so forth. And that's one thing I think you can do with switches and sensors. Um, in terms of going back to this diagram, uh, we could think about an element of some form, right? Anything that interacts with a series of parameters. Those parameters could include force, movement, environment, sound, event, right? So in a simple sense, later we'll get to this, but I could have a distance sensor, and the particular force here would be movement or distance between my hand and the sensor. So that's an element. I could use this element in a variety of senses. If I were doing a visual art installation or performance art, I could have this set up um, in a space, and this is where interactive immersive space design comes into play a little bit. I could have this set up in such a way that when someone comes in contact or in proximity with this, some situation happens that triggers uh, the sensor, that sensor then triggers another event. And that's why we're really talking about interactive and, and feedback design in this video because you're getting into the crux, I think, of what makes this particular device so incredibly powerful and revolutionary. Even with the other little bits and other kits out there, they, they've struck, I think, something here, and I cannot wait uh, for their next device, which I, I supported on Kickstarter, which is their effects unit. And I think that's going to be really amazing. And down the road, I keep thinking, a second field kit to get give me a second driver and four more channels of sound would be pretty amazing. But for now, I'm going to stick with this for the sake of simplicity, one field kit. So we get to the sensor or the switch. Um, I think two things to think about later, we'll talk about this is, are you having something continuous going on? My first experiment I'll show you using our synthesizer today, um, a joystick, and the joystick allows me for some continuous um, effect on a parameter on this device or an external device. So in other words, you can almost think about this in terms of variables. If you had a discrete variable, the thing is either on or off. And indeed, I'll show you some of the switches or sensors. If it's a button switch, it's almost use, useless, I think, to use in the context of the field kit. What I want to suggest to you today is that you have to decide on your own what you want to use in terms of sensors and switches, and that's one of the fun things about getting involved with the field kit. So once you decide on that, and I should say, you know, the continuous sensor switch basically would allow you to go from a really low um, value of some variable, some parameter, let's say that's the envelope um, on your filter, on your CV synthesizer, um, to, to a higher value, right? So that gives me a continuous range of things I'm affecting in the course of using the sensor. The previous chart, again, is getting into this idea that you should think about context, interaction, and process before you maybe get into sensors, before you get into switches, because it really does depend on what you want to do. Um, I should say, like, if you were playing in a... Um, a band or something like this, a keyboardist or some sort of um, instrumentalist using electronic music, and you were thinking of using this in this context, um, you know, unless you're doing experimental stuff, it may not be your thing. This has a particular time and place, context and use for it, um, just because of what it does do and what it doesn't do, basically. Okay, so once I decide on my sensor or switch, then I can have that doing different things. I could send it to the envelope follower. I can have it control the CB radio block. I can send it to a, uh, a synth in terms of control voltage. I can have it controlling the DC driver. And then beyond that, we have other elements um, within the seven blocks here 
In terms of the output block and the LFO block, I have a speaker. I can interact with that. The speaker output is very cool. And then I also have the LFO. There is external stuff as well. So the number of permutations and interactive moments, if you will, are infinite. And we, we obviously can't touch on all that today, but I want to talk about sensors and switches in the context of this interactive uh, feedback design. And then, of course, relative to all this is our mixer. And the mixer is pretty cool because, of course, you can control gain, um, you can give some distortion, and you can use that auxiliary bus to do some interesting things with your effects. Um, so we will come back to uh, some of these, this distance uh, sensor later. And I've used that in a previous video. Maybe you've seen that, experimenting with that, and also the, um, the light sensor. Uh, you know, one thing I was thinking about for the future, I won't cover this today, but if you know about... Um, Theme Space Design, which is the other hat I wear. Um, you may have heard of these uh, Ideo method cards. And these are a way basically to create creativity in, in visual senses and spatial senses. And they're basically cards or activities that allow you um, to do some interesting operations in terms of, uh, this one is on uh, cultural probes. This one I think is on empathy tools. Um, experiences, how to draw the experiences. This is basically a creativity kit. So I had this concept for the future, um, probably on my video talking about bricolage and design of these sound experiments. I was thinking, what if you started to think of some of the qualities in these diagrams? And for example, if you wanted to create chance operations or focus on process in your sound design or in your musical elements, you come up with a way maybe visually uh, to, to do this, right? To think of the different elements, how you combine them. You could also do that in terms of specific devices or sound qualities, metallic sounds versus wooden sounds. If I wanted to use the uh, DC uh, driver, say for the solenoid, and I want to have a percussive effect on something, and I'm thinking of something wooden or something organic, like a table, I would then, of course, incorporate elements at this level of interaction to create a specific process that is memorable uh, or, or reminds us of something wooden or organic or whatever. So um, just as an FYI for the future, we'll, we'll come back to this, but it's something I want to think about in a future video when we talk about some things. Okay, and just to mention, you probably know this, but the uh, 50 Ways to Use the Field Kit, I think, is, is a really um, pretty remarkable manual. Not in the sense that it gets really in-depth in terms of um, the design of the instrument. There's enough in there. But in terms of all these experiments, the 50 Ways approach, um, this really does take you out of your paradigm musically and sonically. I think by doing this, they have very smartly said to the user, don't think of this only in one sense, in using it with your gear in the way that you've used it in the past. Think of it in some new senses, and that for me is what makes this particular device so creative. Um, okay, so next I think we should get into the actual sensors and switches here with the Coma Electronic uh, Field Kit. Okay, so let's go ahead and fade in our synthesizer. Love will sound good. I'll take these headphones off. They don't look particularly great on film, do they? Um, but in any case, I'm using something very simple here, my um, six oscillator synth, which is very basic, um, in order to just show you some of the interactive uh, potentials here. So what we have going on is, um, and actually right now we have nothing going on because I forgot to put in the all important, it has one uh, CV input here, so we're going to insert that here. And I probably will have to stick the headphones on from time to time just to make sure that we're got sound going here as I'm recording, but I think we're good. Okay, so um, I guess what I'm going to do is explain then how I approach getting into um, using switches and signals. So when I first got the unit, as all of you did, and I also bought the expansion, I went to the section in the field kit that talked about switches and sensors. And that is um, on page... Uh, 29. And so it talks a little bit about um, the sensor interface, how it works, and so forth. Um, but very little here. And then at the back of the manual, it talks a little bit in the FAQs about what type of um, sensors and switches can be used. And they mention, of course, there are 5 volt um, sensors and switches. And all of these are the um, Arduino compatible um, 
sensors and switches. So um, what I did was, because I'm not an electronics guy, I don't work with circuit boards, I don't do chip tune stuff, I don't modify that kind of stuff, I have no electronics background, um, which you'll see if you watch some of my soldering videos on the DC interface. I'm not a pro on this, um, which is good news, I think, for all of you that maybe share some of that in common with me because basically I want to suggest that you can get started very quickly with sensors and switches with very little money and very little knowledge, which is awesome. And then you can just get into sound design. What I would suggest to you is what I've done here, aside from the field kit and the expansion, I've purchased the equipment for this um, that probably costs around $30 or so. It's very cheap. So two things you'll need. You'll need sensors and switches. You can, you can do one of two things, and I recommend going to Amazon. For the things I purchased, I'll show you screenshots up on the video of what I purchased. Of course, you can buy whatever you want, do your own searching around. Um, I search on Amazon because it's um, easy and I have Prime and all that kind of stuff. So first thing you'll need will be the um, for the Arduino switches and sensors are these guys here. And uh, this particular pack was like $7.99. I think it includes 40 of these. They're color coded. They are, you know, braided on here or they're um, glued on here. So you just pull off however many you need. You're always basically with sensors or switches working with three sets of wires. I've also mentioned I like using them for the antenna for the uh, CV radio um, interface. They work really well for that. They fit in the exact same way. You have the male end and you have the female end, you'll get um, you know, a number of these if you want to connect a bunch together. But basically, all you need are three of these total. So if, if you're not doing anything else, which I don't, you know, I don't do the Arduino stuff with the computer, um, this is probably more than I need, but you can buy you know, as few as you want. And basically what you're doing is, you are inserting those three wires. Um, let me make sure the GoPro is working here. Okay, so the GoPro will just get you in focus here. Um, so you're working basically with these three holes here. And from the bottom up, you, you can see this on the unit, you have the ground, which in my case is going to be a brown wire. You have the, the voltage, the five volt, which is red. And then you have the, in my case, the orange, which is the data um, line. And that's the exact same for the switch in. Um, and the switch in is a little more complicated in terms of what you can do. There are two outputs and you can use those simultaneously. I'm mostly today I think using the sensors in this. Um, so you'll need sensors and switches after you have your um, Arduino cables and I'll, I'll put that up so you can see exactly what I ordered. They're really reasonable. You'll need sensors and switches. Um, initially what I did was I was poking around and I said I'll buy some individual ones. So this was the first one I bought. It was $4.99. It's a distance sensor and it actually came with uh, the wires built in. So in some cases you can actually get that and this is a pretty handy little uh, plug-in uh, unit here where these plug in and then you just plug these into your sensor input on the field kit and you're ready to go, you are making sound, modifying sound instantaneously. But I, I thought to myself, I got this, I played around with it, and I said, let me get a, um, a full-fledged kit. So I poked around on Amazon and I found this particular one. And this ran, I think it was $27.99. Uh, so it basically comes in this plastic container and it has a, um, a guide that purports to have all these sensors labeled and the thing I noticed when I bought this is it's um, six rows across, six down. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight down columns, um, sorry, rows, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the top. So, um, you know, what I decided was I would have to go through and test every single sensor in this um, kit to see what would work and what wouldn't work with you know potential future sound design and then I, I said I, I also need to then create my own sheet to notate what I'm working with here because this sheet was was not very good it also included a DVD with what appeared to be um, PDFs of various books and other things as well and so what I did was I said I need to take this sheet and modify it and this was the result so just in Microsoft Word, I created, I did little um, screenshots and then created my own column. So for me, um, this was kind of useless, this particular sheet. There were some errors on it. 
Um, it did come with some information in a Word file which told me about each sensor, but I have to admit I did a lot of Googling and I found one really good site which I'll put up here, which um, someone did a very similar version uh, for the 37, or excuse me, the 27 in one kit. This was I think billed as 45. Um, different sensors or switches. I will say it includes a lot of things that for me are irrelevant. For example, um, it includes an SD card reader. I have no use for that in sound design that I can think of. It includes a ton of um, LEDs and I was reading in the uh, 50 ways to use uh, manual interactive things going on between the uh, DC driver and the sensor, particularly using a light sensor or infrared sensor. The thing, of course, is I'd have to think about taking, these are rated for 5 volts, the driver is 9 volts. So I, I haven't really thought about getting an LED unit yet for the, the driver, but that'd be an interactive potential in the future. And then they also have things like this. This is a smoke sensor. Um, and also a fume sensor. I guess what you might get on a smoke detector. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm probably not going to be lighting stuff on fire in the course of musical performance or composition, um, unless you're doing Mark Pauline survival research labs level performance art with fire and flames and shooting robots and stuff. Um, you know, again, some of these probably won't come into play, but you can put those aside. What I did was I said, I'm only going to put the ones inside here and make labels or uh, this chart for the ones that have some use to them. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll just go through each of these as many as maybe is interesting. There's a lot of overlap with, with some of these. So I, I tested each of them and I thought I'll try to um, look at them today. Here's how I organize them. Basically, I have a column here for anything that involves a field, and these are all these. So for example, we have a reed switch, which uses a magnet, and I'll get my, my magnet and stuff here ready. Um, all the accoutrements that we'll be using, water, um, we're going to use the basal plant, I'm going to use a marker and pen for some cool stuff with the tracking sensor. Um, but this first column would be magnetic, um, and um, I think it's all actually in this case magnetic, we'll look at those. Um, next would be switches, joystick button rotary, next would be environment, so things like water, soil moisture, photo um, resistance, uh, flame and sound, so audio. Next would be force, shock, tap, touch, ball, movement, tilting, tilting plus a light cup and so forth. And then the last um, selection would be the curious ones. And th this has some remarkable stuff. This uh, HCSR04, which is like the, the bat um, honing uh, device that sends out a 40 kilohertz signal and then uh, tracks the return of it in the other sensor. So that's kind of interesting. There's a, um, a tracking sensor, which I'm going to diagram with you later, is really interesting. And there's a heartbeat. And I know someone did a really nice video on using the heartbeat sensor with the Coma Feel Kit. I didn't get mine to work yet. And that's one of the things I want to stress to you on this is, you know, don't get frustrated when you work with sensors like this. I spent probably two to four hours organizing, testing, trying to understand what I have going here. And so it's it's a, a process of trial and error. What I recommend is first organizing your sensors in some way that makes sense for your own setup. As I said, you could do something like organizing it via these various parameters or approaches. And then when you need to use the sensors, you pull them out and you attach them to a unit. And then you go back to those other charts and you think about sound design and how you want to conceptualize your approach to your musical space or creation or whatever. So let's try a few of these out. Let us uh, throw the headphones on to make sure. Okay, we have a pitch. All right, so I think I'll just leave the headphones on since um, it'll give me a chance to, let's make this a little beefier. Okay. By the way, this is a dry signal. We're not going to do anything fancy with the sound. We're just purely thinking about um, the ability of using the sensor. So I have my first one set up, and that is this guy here. It's a switch. Um, and I think it ha I have it on the, uh, the sensor input. But in any case, it's a joystick. And so let's experiment a little bit with that.
Okay, so, um, you know, overall, uh, I guess you could say interesting. And in this particular experiment, what we're looking at, you could say, is just um, using an input device, a switch, to control the sound. And you can see I could get, I think, a fairly decent continuous movement um, of the sound with the using, the um, again, the CV input from the signal output on the coma. So that's our first one. Maybe since we're doing switches, we can continue. What about, um, this is the most worthless one. And this is a button input. Now I should say, um, for most purposes, hold on, we have a pen here. I just wanted to mention, Okay, for most of the sensors that um, I've discovered, and there are some exceptions, what I always do is, um, I have on my chart here, if the order of the three pins, we're getting some staticky stuff, some kind of signal. Um, keep in mind the output from the um, sensor um, block is always sending uh, a voltage, so we can actually you know, control, I don't, I don't have this on now, but if I did, right, we can control it. And this is just the, um, the offset and the level of this signal. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that what I try to keep in mind is that these have to go in in a particular order. Let me turn that down, sorry. And so in most cases, it's this order. It is, let's go when you get older, your glasses, your um, close-up vision goes a little bit. So, but let's go ahead and put this in. Um, again, brown for me, I'm just going to keep this as my system. Brown is my ground. Red is the 5 volt. These are always hard to see too, by the way. And then our top one is the data. Okay. So, um, this is generally then starting at the bottom pin of any sensor. It generally is like it is on the field kit ground, volt, um, the 5 volt, and then the data. Um, I've noticed with a couple of my sensors, it's not the case um, when you get into the 4-pin ones. Um, it's a little different. My soil moisture one, the, um, I thought there was a few, there are a few others here. The um, H, uh, HCSR04 is also a little different. So these are not always the case, and, and two ways to discover this. One is to luck, if I have an example here, I'm sure the GoPro is not going to pick this up, but you can look at the bottom of where the pins are, and sometimes it'll say G, it'll say V, which is your 5 volt. It might say D or A, so analog or digital. If you have four inputs, you're only going to use three, of course, with the field kit. Um, so what I recommend is looking at the side of the sensor. You can also, if there's documentation included, um, look that up to try to see the order um, of the um, pins, or you could go online, Google that particular sensor, and you'll probably find a diagram. So just something to note there. Okay, so this is the button sensor. Let's turn up our volume on the synth. Okay. And there you go. So it's worthless, right? I mean, a button sensor really doesn't have any Thing interesting to offer us um, in terms of this particular unit. You know, the rotary one, similarly, um, I think if you get into... Okay, so you're seeing here, or hearing, slight variation in sound. Okay. So I, I think the thing to point out is that some of these will work better for you than others. There's no right or wrong way to use sensors. Um, and it's kind of up to you, to, I guess, to experiment. Um, so the next we could look at, um, these are all actually magnetic sensors. So this particular kit came with two, three, four, five, six different magnetic um, sensors. So let's just look at one of these, you'll get the point. And, um, one thing I thought would be interesting about this sensor would be maybe to use an electromagnet. So you could get an electromagnet, um, 
there are nine volt available, uh, nine volt versions available on Amazon, and you can run that out of the DC driver, and then maybe do some interesting interactive things between the DC driver and this magnetic sensor. So let's turn on our synthesizer. Okay, and let's get our magnet. Okay, we'll get our magnet and well, here's something here. We want to experiment a little more with these magnetic sensors because one of the things when I was talking earlier about something continuous in terms of the sensor versus either on or either off. Um, this, you know, didn't have a lot of um, usefulness in terms of, I think, what was going on sonically, right? It was just essentially either one of two particular tones, so. Okay, next maybe we'll look at um, some of the four sensors. So the first of these is a shock sensor, and this will detect, get you hooked up here. I don't know like you or like me, but I just, um, if you've experienced this, but these are so small to work with. I need reading glasses. It's a reminder of age. Okay, let's try this. Get some sound. Okay, um, it's being really interesting. Let's see here. something interesting happening sonically okay so I was thinking with that particular sensor um, the shock sensor you could have it set on something you could get an interactive thing going on between the DC driver the solenoid or the motor such that the force would interact with the sensor um, in some way what else can we look at um, we have variations of this the tilt sensor is here okay and there's another one similar a light cup and it's got the same like a mercury element in there and the idea is that when you move it it is um, the LED is supposed to light up but for me it's never lit up so let's just look at the simple tilt sensor and there is an experiment in the 50 ways a book that talks about using a tilt sensor with the um, filter on your synthesizer. Um, this does not have a filter, but we will um, just use it to get a sense of the basics of, um, you see it blinking there, and that apparently is indicating when there's movement in the sensor. Let's turn up our sound. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, can you if you can pick this up on the GoPro, but a little mercury element, right? When it's just in a sort of sweet spot there, get some really cool stuff going on. Look at that. Okay, you get the idea. Um, that is not musically interesting in any sense. And again, I'm just using this in the most functional sense today, 
using the simplest synthesizer because we're not going for anything at the level of uh, musicality. Um, but this has some potential, right? Again, think about um, movement of, say, a robot, a device in a sonic space that you create that's an interactive space as well. You can do some really phenomenal things. So I think there's a lot of potential here with these force sensors. Again, this is my labeling organization of them based on working through them. Um, let's go to the environmental ones next. So there are a series of these. One we're not going to try. is the flame sensor. I did try this by the stove, but um, there's no sense in lighting a fire here again. It's not something I want to do necessarily around my electronic gear, but you could, right? So this detects flame and um, you can also get a heat sensor. Um, this maybe also works as a heat sensor. I should say there were some temperature sensors that came in this particular kit. Um, I couldn't get a single one of them to work and it could be the thing that maybe there's a threshold it needs to detect a certain temperature and then something happens and keep in mind when you're working with arduino and i'm sure there are people that are going to take it maybe to a level where you could interact um, outside of just the sensors themselves and have a cpu small cpu unit going and a code that allows you to do some things in that case of course then you could really specify thresholds at a numerical value level such that things could happen in your installation. So probably that's what's going on with my use of these temperature sensors. Okay, um, next we'll continue with the environmental ones. So we have um, a couple sound sensors. I don't think I've really tried these out. And let's hope, see this has a marking here so I can easily see the ground it's at the bottom. And then it seems like we're always doing our five volt next. And you know, the other thing you can do is trial and error. If you have a four pin unit, a sensor, you could always experiment until you get it right, I suppose. Okay. Okay, I actually had it wrong. So, um, yeah, the ground was one up, and you, as you can see, we're getting our LEDs lighting up. So this one, um, what I noticed is you can make a sound. It has to hit the threshold. And so the only thing I found, this has probably no use, but you can blow into the sensor, and let's try that. and that affects the sound. So um, this potentially, again, I don't know, um, actually in this one, it has a threshold. So if you buy this kit, take a mini screwdriver and adjust the threshold. You can kind of do it with your finger, but you're gonna need a mini screwdriver um, because the threshold is obviously key. If you wanted to have the sound of the DC driver hitting something and have that sound triggering something else, then there's a, a possibility there. You can start to see with some of these sensors, if you had a second field kit, you could really increase by twofold, right, the interactivity between various elements in your sound design. Okay, so um, two other environmental ones. Let's try the um, water sensor. Uh, again, water and electronics generally don't go together, but in this case they do. This, I think, starts to feel more like some sort of installation, you know, you might create um, with different elements, air, fire, water, whatever, sound. Um, so the idea behind this is we're going to take the sensor and um, it will go into some water and then see the effect on the sound. So let's check that out.
Okay. Okay, for whatever reason, um, I got this to work the other night with the Oak Host. Um, we are getting some effect, I just don't know. What is going on with it? Okay, so this was one of these the other night. It worked perfectly. It's not working for me right now. So, um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on. Again, you can see a lot of trial and error. Let's try the next one. It might have the same effect. Um, and if it does, you can, I don't know, you can, I guess, chuckle a bit, because we, first time ever using a plant, Okay, so this is kind of a first using um, plant, a basal plant to uh, control sound. Um, this particular unit, by the way, came with this little circuit here. Um, I figured out that it goes actually the voltage, the five, the ground, and then the data. So again, it's a, this one's a little bit different order than the typical. And then here's the actual sensor. So we'll put into the plant. So maybe we'll start first without the plant or without sensor. Okay, and aha, you know what? The offset. What you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go back to the water sensor after this. My offset was off. Here we go. Well, that's pretty wicked, actually. Wow. Thinking. Let's add a little bit of water in the plant and then check that out. Did you hear the difference? I think you did. Okay, that's very cool. And just listen to what it's doing to the sound. Okay, this is above. I'm going to stick it in the plant. Added that water there. You hear the sound changing. I mean, that's just one that is, frankly, sonically kind of interesting. Um, again, don't ask me any questions about what's actually happening here at this micro level um, in terms of the computing, but, you know, sonically, very interesting. So let's try this. Let's turn our sound down since we had success. Um, I think what happened with our last one was, you might want to clean this off afterwards, right? It's kind of dirty. Let's put our basil plant out of the way. How often do you use a basil plant in a sound experiment? Let's try this again. We're going to go back to our water sensor because I was frustrated at what happened. I think my offset was too low. Um, I, for the most part, it's been like about 12 o'clock on the offset and the level. So let's try that again and see what happens uh, with the water sensor. Let's fade in our volume. Okay. There we go. All right. It's exciting. It's that eureka moment. It's like we finally achieved something because there's an old, I remember playing in bands um, 
garage band since like middle school or whatever. And, um, you know, we'd have a problem with the recording, something going on with our amps or setup. We'd spend like a half an hour on the stuff. And then we discover it was the volume switch or it was the on off switch on the synthesizer on the amp or four track recorder. So sometimes it's something as simple as that. It's the offset. So um, let's check this out to see what's going to happen here. Let's see if the GoPro picks this up. Okay, that, listen what's going on sonically. Oh, that is wicked. Oh, just listen to sound, listen to that. And I think what's happening here, and feel free to comment on this if you have a more technical answer, but as the water is dripping off of this, we're getting that effect right on the sensor itself. Let's get crazy, you wanna do another oscillator, okay. I'll try that. Let's go for it. Okay, I can do that for like an hour. I'll spare you because this video is already long, but um, that's pretty amazing, actually. Uh, yeah, so that's what I'm thinking of. Um, just the quality of the sound, and again, it suggests to me not an on-off, sort of a dichotomous either there or not there, but um, values, movement, and, and that's what I'm kind of looking for in doing my own sound experiments. Right, so that closes up or um, finishes up the... Um, what I call the environmental sensors. Um, there's one more, and that is the uh, photoresistor. Where are you? There somewhere. I'm not gonna do this. I did an entire um, video showing you the distance and the photo one, but you get the idea, right? We could shine a light on it. It gets really useful with um, LEDs, with flashlights. You can get these mini pen lights um, like this, which is for coins and stuff, and have this interact with it. You can also have it interact with um, visual um, light-based uh, imagery on your, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get it in the right row, because if you get these off, there we go. Um, but you could do some interesting visual things as I did with a monitor, a computer monitor, to have it interact at that level. So check that those other videos out. Um, last three I'll talk about today. One is the heartbeat sensor. Haven't gotten us to work yet, um, but you know what? Let's give it a shot. There's a really great video um, online that you could check out that has uh, someone who does this successfully, but uh, I've had some new luck here ever since I figured out I had the offset too low, so let's go for it, and if it doesn't work, um, You'll never know about it because I can edit the video, so it'll be lost forever. But we shall try. Let's let's see if it detects a heartbeat here. Okay. Okay, I tried to adjust the offset and the level, but again, I'm just not getting much out of that. So um, check out that other video with the heartbeat sensor that's really good, and uh, potentially um, I will continue to work on that. Let me show you this cool one here. These are on my Curious. This is the HCSR04. Um, and this is a little bit different too. So this starts at the top, and this is labeled, but I have it on my chart too. So we put our ground at the top, Put our data next, which in my configuration is the orange cord. And then we skip one and the five volts is at the bottom. Okay. 
So the idea behind this is it's like the echolocation system um, of bats. So you send out a sound and it's waiting to hear it back in the other sensor. So um, I've discovered it's does almost like a distance sensor. It's very similar to what I discovered with the distance sensor. So let's check that out. Okay, so that one I tried as well, the other one I have the Oak Host, and I had better luck. It was doing some really interesting sonic things. With this synth, it's not doing um, quite as much, so we'll just have to, uh, to come back to that one. But again, so far the water-based sensors I think are quite phenomenal. Now let's try this last guy here. This is the tracking sensor, and this one is, I don't want to say it's really cool because if it doesn't work, You'll be disappointed, but let's let's get this fired up, and I'll tell you what it does. Um, and this one I think could be really cool. I have this um, mini cheap robot that's like a a drawing robot. It basically draws for you. And my thought was I could use it in conjunction with this. So here's what it does. Let's take some paper and a sharpie. The idea is that when it detects black. Um, they mention, I read about it, black and white. When it detects black, it will um, trigger the sensor. So let's turn up the sound and try that. Okay, so um, this was one the other night that worked a little better too because I was noticing more subtlety to it. It would detect um, the black line and then it would, you know, change the sound. And then when it detected white, it would um, do the reverse. So it, it worked a little more subtly the other night when I tried it. But this one was one of those that I thought had a lot of interesting potential. Um, yeah, so I went through, um, I think, a variety of the sensors. I realized, so a lot of these are switches, and I didn't actually put them into the, um, the switch um, inputs, right, which is at the top here. And um, read up on that in the manual, because certainly you can use both of these inputs at the same time. I was primarily using everything as a sensor input. Um, there is obviously a difference between sensors and switches, but I was primarily using the sensor input for um, the sake of, of convenience today. So I think that's um, all I'm going to cover. Again, I think as you explore more of this on your own, you maybe will purchase a kit like this or some very specific sensors for you to use. You'll hook it up to your gear. You'll experiment with it. Make some notes, You know, keep a journal, create a chart of some sort so that you have a sense of what you're working with Going back to what I said earlier, think about the overall interactive sound design you want to create. Think of sensors and switches as part of that overall approach that holistically and the big picture of things allows you to create some really interesting things with your sound. So um, be on the lookout. I'll do more sound experiments as I can. I really enjoy the uh, Facebook group and the stuff happening on YouTube with other people 
experimenting here with the Coma uh, electronic um, field kit. So uh, I'll see you for the next uh, video in the future.